Welcome back to my plant growing series on the giant Bangkok cutting that I have. It's day 207. My guava cutting is the picture of health. There has been a lot of foliage development. Everything is very erect and upright. The ends of the little twigs are pink and the petioles also. So that signifies that the growth is recent and that everything's very healthy. Um, there's great turgor pressure. Don't really see any signs of disease at this point. So things are going pretty well. Uh, I don't read the comments very often, but I did read a comment um, just now that was actually posted months ago on, I think, the first episode of the series that said I got a diseased plant from the nursery. And I think that's right because after not too long, all the leaves basically uh, became sort of mottled and disease ridden looking. So um, I'm treating with another dose of imidacloprid treatment. I don't want those days to come back. On day 219 I went on a hike and I clipped a bunch of weeds to use as fertilizer and I'm still using this trick with many of my other plants. I'm putting the duff essentially on top and within a few days it, it basically fades away out of sight mostly because uh, it changes color and withers away and it seems like the nutrients are getting back in there over the course of the weeks thereafter but who really knows what's going on there. So I still spray the leaves with distilled water from time to time, um, but it's quite a chore because my plants are getting big and that's not really something I have the inclination to do like every other day or whatever. So it's day 225. I do cover 164 days of growth and events and changes in strategy during this entire time. So uh, it's just a 24 minute episode so to cover 164 days, that's a lot. So I'm using my hand to show you uh, relatively how big these leaves have gotten. It's day 232. There's new growth everywhere yet again. Occasionally you will see a leaf here or there in the middle. Uh, some of the older growth uh, or where the plant stalled um, during the winter of 2019. And then things resumed and those leaves kind of got left behind. So. Um, yeah, I clip away the stuff that looks unhealthy from time to time. You can see a little leaf down there that's uh, sort of dead. And that's why the plant looks amazing. So it's day 245. The plant's branches are elongating. It's giving it a more upright, spindly look. As you can see, there are several nodes uh, without foliage. So uh, without going back to review the footage, I'm pretty sure I lost some leaves. Um, early on in the series and now it'll take a while for all of those spots to fill out the vacant spots so you can see the duff layer on top and I don't know how well it's working but it seems to provide ideal conditions for weed growth that's why the weeds keep popping back it's day 259 the plant still looks to be in good health although I would say that the growth has stalled out a little bit the new leaves aren't coming in as fast. These uh, bottom stems don't seem to be any longer. The petioles are still a hot pink, but you really got to pay attention to whether the stems are getting longer and the color at the end of some of those stems. On some of the side stems, it's turning a light brown. It's transitioning. Things are maturing without that much additional growth. So I'm starting to suspect that something is wrong because September, which it now is, is a very hot month in San Diego. We have a Mediterranean climate. August, September, and October are basically the summer months of San Diego and other places in California. So we do get very wet winters. Uh, the growth season will be gone pretty soon. I think that might be a dead aphid, and I don't know what these little brown bugs are. I think once they try to feed on this plant, they basically die because of the imidacloprid, they get poisoned. So there's still a lot of systemic resistance. On day 274, I decided to start using chemical fertilizer, miracle Grow again, which I haven't used for a year or two on all of my plants. So that's how I make decisions. I decide that the current uh, MO or methodology isn't working well for my plants and if I think there's something better I just switch 
uh, simultaneously for everything at once. So I'm sure you're pretty familiar with this unless you're new to my channel. They sell this in every store basically. If you're using this on outdoor plants, you use the big end of the scoop. And this is distilled water stored in a laundry bottle that's been really well washed out. So it's rare that I get to show you some outdoors footage these days because uh, I typically get home from work late and then I have to film at night, use my LED panels. As you can see, it's not fully dissolved there. I'll show you that a little bit more later, but there's not that many weeds coming back. Um, maybe the problem is the soil mass has been deprived of all its nitrogen mostly for additional fast growth. So this should replenish everything. As you can see there, as I said, it's not completely dissolved. So it's day 295. The clovers are making a comeback again. And maybe that's due to me fertilizing for the first time using chemical fertilizer. So at some point I'm thinking I'm just going to get rid of this duff layer. And I have to keep weeding because the duff layer preserves moisture and it really encourages uh, these little weeds to grow. So the nascent trunk is expanding hence the bark is peeling. So that's a very good sign actually and we didn't see that before then. So it would be a mighty coincidence if what I'm showing you at this point in the episode is due to the duff layer kicking in finally but I don't think that's what it was. It essentially is the chemical fertilizer. So you can see some new growth there. It's bright green on the tip of one of the bottom branches, the side shoots. So some of those leaves are old and underdeveloped near the center of the main stem. I always cut those away eventually. Uh, new growth abounds now, but some of these uh, older, bigger leaves are mottled. I don't know if they're just going to be shed or are they being burned by the fertilizer or what have you but um, regardless at the rate things are going uh, we're going to make a big comeback uh, look how beautiful that light green new stuff looks so we're actually doing pretty well I think now so that was the right move in my opinion you can see in some of these uh, long vacant spots uh, new leaves are sprouting so I think what happened was uh, what I just said, the little soil mass here was just completely uh, deprived of nitrogen and other macronutrients for plants that all these plants need to grow and hence I didn't see a new burst of weeds until I uh, fertilized. So things are growing pretty well now I would say. Um, the plant might not look that aesthetic right now but it should look a lot better. Uh, going forward. So we have these brutal Santa Ana winds that come typically in October. We had one that broke one of the leaves there. It's day 310. So uh, no new weeds but there's additional trunk growth which is really good. So I think the plant needs um, you know maybe the big three at least or more than nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus to uh, get thick healthy stems. I think that's been a problem particularly with my pomegranate uh, seedling and I think the chemical fertilizer really made a difference there over time it thickened th the stems up so the main stem um, no longer falls down on its own so if you've been following that series uh, in my last episode you would have seen what I was talking about so we had a very long stretch of Santa Ana winds in late October it tore off uh, maybe four of the biggest leaves I had on this tallest stem. I had this on a glass table, this pot, and right next to the rail. So uh, due to the height of this plant, it's my tallest plant currently, it, it was very prone to getting leaves ripped off at night when the winds were very, very strong. So that's a big pity. It really detracts from the aesthetic look of this entire plant. It's day 321. I bought a 12 pack of Rubbermaid soft waste baskets off Amazon, prorated to about $3 each. It's a really good deal. I'll use uh, two of them as indoor trash cans. And the edges are very soft, they don't need to be sanded. 
and they won't scrape your calves or uh, your shins at night when uh, you brush up against them for instance so these things stack and they have a very delicate soft touch to them I really like these things and um, I saw them on Amazon as I was looking for putative containers to make planters with. So I used to use these Misco brand planters, that's M-I-S-C-O. I'm sure you're very familiar with them if you followed my channel for a few years. They're uh, aesthetic looking, they have this bottom watering tray with this big open lip where you can see how much water is dripping down in there and whether they're about to overflow. So they used to be ubiquitous, they used to be in any Lowe's or Target I would go to or Walmart and they would be reasonably priced, um, sometimes pretty cheap too. But at some point, maybe two or three years ago, they stopped uh, showing up in stores. I only saw them on Amazon, they're expensive. So it stays 329, I'm um, doing more prep work, so I'm drilling four holes about three and a half to four centimeters above the corners. This will serve as air exchange and drainage. In the outer waste basket, I have to make the holes big enough. And for the inner basket, I'm gonna use the third smallest drill bit. Of course, that doesn't apply if you have a different size drill bit set. But I'm going to drill eight small holes in the perimeter. And the reason I'm gonna keep them small is because I don't want all the sand and clay to just run out of these holes over time as I water and there's overflow and eventually just fill up the outer watering tray. That would be pointless, the roots wouldn't have access to it and uh, oxygen fluid exchange would just be difficult then. So I'm done drilling this uh, sample demo. In a waste basket has eight smaller holes instead of the four big ones and I'll just stack them and that's it. I'll be done and these are ready to use so I'm really liking these trash cans so I tested these before alone and stacked in the sink beforehand for drainage just to check out the drain rates and make sure that the holes weren't too small so it's day 330 this is the second transplant in less than a year so as you can see these two pots um, these are not Misco brand and the Misco brand ones were they're very wide at the top, but they're also uh, wider than these two on the bottom. So now you just see a lot of these cheap, generic-looking planters in big box stores, and uh, I don't really like them. Can't see what's going on in the watering tray. So the 50% sand, 50% clay soil mix is rock hard, despite all the roots going through it. It's taking me forever to dig my fingers in there. So as you can see, um, I'm finally getting this thing to come loose and you hear a little bit of breaking. So I'm sure I'm breaking a lot of these little roots here. Roots on the outside of the ball are all fine and delicate. Um, I'm going to dig away as gently as I can all of this uh, sand and soil mixture just to see if uh, there are bigger roots inside. But yeah, I'm pressing against this and it, it feels like a rock. I can see why many people say that mixing sand and clay makes concrete. Although this is missing the ingredient of cement, um, that's what concrete traditionally was made of, sand, clay, and cement. So I have no doubt that this is much more breathable than uh, potting mix or other mediums composed of dead organics because those things just rock continuously. And as I've said many other times in other episodes and other series, I don't think that's the way to go to grow plants in uh, dead organic stuff. I think that belongs either on top or you should just use chemical fertilizer. I've also heard that you could just grow things in pure sand, but I don't think I'd appreciate that due to the lack of structure. I don't want things shifting around either. The sand is about one-third airspace, I believe, whereas um, if you have a soil that's more than 40% clay, after you water and it dries, It'll be completely impermeable to oxygen and things will die regardless. So you have to find a balance and not use too much clay. So I'm pretty much done with these pots. I believe that these uh, new waste baskets from Rubbermaid will serve me very well. Hopefully they're durable. I don't want something that cracks in the sun later on. 
So this is a live single-handed demo of how I get my clay soil from the wild hills nearby. So um, just preparing for a trip like this is quite a bit of work. But I use a small wastebasket, hand trowel, leather gloves, and a glander I bought on Amazon, a strainer basket. It's not that cheap, but I wanted to spend a little bit more and get something good. And the leather gloves work better if you're going to do this with a lot of soil volume. So the slopes dry out first. You should do this after it's been raining for a while, uh, a few days later. So go to one of the slopes nearby and um, this clay soil is actually more pebbles and rocks than it is clay. So you'll spend a lot of time doing this actually. It takes uh, maybe a, close to an hour to fill up something of this size. I think this little Waste basket can hold nine quarts. That's not too far off from being nine liters, I believe. Quarts and liters are about the same. So, um, yeah, do the straining. Um, this is more um, user friendly than nitrile gloves, actually, to wear the leather gloves. And just give it a little shake and dump everything out. So, this is back breaking work. Don't get too ambitious for one day thinking, oh, I'm going to get however many gallons or, or liters of this fine red filtered dirt. Of course there's a little bit of organics, uh, little bits of dead plant matter in there because we are digging from the top. So I've decided instead of 50-50 mix, uh, I have a sample here, I'm going to use a 75% sand, 25% clay mix instead, which will give things more breathability. It shouldn't form a cement-like rock or a mass um, as I just showed you. And I believe this will enable the roots to breathe easier and hence grow thicker and faster. So use any small container and measure out three volumes of sand for every one volume, um, which you'll mix in the middle like this of red clay soil or whatever clay soil you have in your neighborhood. It doesn't even have to be clay really. Although I figure since the granularity of the sand is so big, um, I wanted to mix it with something fine, so it really depends on what's in your neighborhood. If your local soil is high in silt or sand, then perhaps you can use a 50-50 mix or even 75% or 100 if your local soil is very, very sandy. But I think for most people, it'll be sort of a loam, a sort of a mixture, so I wouldn't add too much. And plus it's a lot easier just to buy a $7 bag of play sand that's been pre-washed. It does weigh 50 pounds though, so you do need a fair bit of muscle and work to get that back to your home and use it. But it is a lot more convenient than digging out something from the outside for use in containers like pots. So of course if you have a yard you can ignore most of this unless your uh, soil is very very clay heavy. then. In the case of most Southern Californians, that is the case. So uh, you would have to do something like this or add in sand. People try to add in organics, but I don't believe that's the way to go um, for many reasons I've talked about in other videos. So always mix along the way. Don't wait until the very end to do your mixing by hand. And it feels to me like a very precious gold dust because of all the work that went into it, not necessarily the expense or anything but just the time and the work and the sweat that went into this. So I'm thinking that this plant will do very well from now on. I think out of the three big transplants that I'm doing today, one for the mango, one for the pomegranate, the guava should do the best. You know how the soil line is about an inch plus or three centimeters below the, the top of the rim of the inner waste basket. So I'm just going to use some tap water and water from the top, wash off the leaves as best as I can and observe how fast the drainage is because I believe it should be greatly improved. So this is on fast forward but you can see it's draining a lot faster. Before with a 50-50 mix um, clay is very resistant to being hydrated when it's bone dry so in previous cases when I transplanted things into the 50-50 mix it would take forever to water anything, even in pots. And in the mango growing in a tube, um, nothing needed to be said. It was just very, very slow and torturous to water my plants. But now it seems like the pace is finally good enough. 
So it's day 344. Look how far the soil line sank after three waterings. So that's really bad news because I'm worried that some of the clay ran out into the bottom tray. But also because the, I wanted to position the root ball as high as possible so it would have room to grow downwards. So um, this pretty much means that everything sank down as the sand compacted after watering. And so far, this plant is doing fine. There's a lot of new growth, actually. So I don't think this guava cutting is missing a beat at all because uh, it's the most well-developed of my plants. And having come from a cutting, it had this huge head start. and has a thick uh, stem or trunk that's uh, expanding very rapidly. So you can see there's new growth everywhere. This uh, offshoot to the side is almost... Um, parallel to the ground because it's so heavy with leaves, which is a good sign. Um, it needs more fertilizer and time perhaps to become thicker. If not, I could always uh, prune it or tie it to the main trunk or the highest stem. As I was saying earlier, I used to use a lot of these misco planters. You can see a beige one to the center left there. And later on, they're all replaced by these uh, cheapo pots that you see on the bottom right in the big box stores. The supply just dried up for the misco planters two to three years ago and they're all expensive on Amazon so I gave up on that and I kept a few but now I've decided that I'll just make my own planters out of waste baskets with this soft plastic. It'll suit my purposes a lot better because the shape is a lot friendlier to the shape of a natural root system which is more of a cone than the way these things are tapered. So it's been two weeks since I've uh, just used water, so I'm now applying some miracle Grow. Hopefully that'll establish a new wave of growth that will continue all the way through winter. I know it seems unlikely with the cold temperatures, but this balcony is pretty sheltered. It'll never reach freezing. Uh, it really does in Southern California. So uh, this is a demo. Not much clay reached the bottom of my um, pomegranate pot the outer watering tray, so to speak. It's day 357. I'm topping off the pot with more of this freshly made 75% sand, 25% clay soil mix. Uh, this is mostly for aesthetics. I know it took me a lot of energy to produce this, but I don't want to have a pot that looks like it's sort of depleted, not filled all the way up. So uh, I'll fill in maybe about over an inch of this stuff. And it will help a little bit with uh, retaining moisture if it gets to the summer months of 2020 and gets really hot again, or the San Diego summer months of uh, August, September, October anyway. And definitely if I leave on a vacation or something, I could just move this closer to the sliding door and make sure everything is saturated with water, even the watering tray, and just uh, let it sort of hibernate throughout the drought. So things are going pretty well. I think this should continue to grow throughout winter. And yeah, what I was saying earlier was just I want a rectangular container because it cuts down on some of the volume. If you have a perfect cylinder, like the container I'm uh, traveling out of right now, then that requires an even greater mass of soil. So uh, a rectangle seems to be you know, more conservative shape in terms of, uh, you know, reducing the energetic cost of me having to haul like a trillion pounds of sand and, and filter a trillion pounds of dirt outside. So that's pretty much it for this episode. Uh, it's been a very long condensed episode covering many months. Thanks for watching and please stay tuned for further updates.